Good morning, dear Intriguer, and welcome to Intrigue Out Loud. On today's show, I'm joined by Intrigue co-founder John Fowler to discuss the big meeting between Presidents Xi and Biden. It's all coming up. Hey, John, how are you? I'm uh, I'm doing well, Ethan. I'm just sort of slowly coming back down to earth after following the the biggest diplomatic meeting in in months. Yeah, we'll we'll get there. <laughs> but anything going on this weekend? Uh, absolutely nothing. No, it's not it's not someone's birthday. It isn't. I don't have birthdays anymore. I've just stopped aging, and uh, wouldn't you all <laughs> like my secret? Oh well, we're all very happy for you. Uh, we'll cut <laughs> hang to. On, it. Hang on, I've still got a couple of days. Don't don't age me prematurely. <laughs> all right. Well, well, this is painful. This is painful for you. So I'll, I'll, I'll quit the torture. Uh, we are talking, as you mentioned, uh, about the meeting between President Xi of China and President Biden of the U.S. If you don't know that, then you know, uh, we can't help you. Probably can't help you there. But I, I want to start at the I want to start at the end, uh, the big headline grabbing soundbite, uh, and get your reaction. Here it is. Mr. President, after today, we do still refer to President Xi as a dictator. This is a term uh, that you used earlier this year. Well, look, he is. I mean, he's a dictator in the sense that he he is a guy who runs a country that is a communist country that based on a former government totally different than ours. If you missed it, the sound quality isn't great because. Uh, Biden had already stepped away from the podium. That was President Biden answering in the affirmative when asked by a reporter if President Xi is a dictator. John, your take, is she a dictator? Uh, <laughs> you're not gonna, unlike President Biden, I'm not going to fall for, for that wily reporter's trap. Um, my reaction to this is, I mean, at the time, I kind of was like, my mouth dropped open. I, I certainly yeah. don't think it's how the State Department would have drawn it up. And I think if you watch the video clip, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a sort of a cutaway to Secretary of State Antony Blinken, who, I'll be honest, not great from a diplomat. He visibly reacts. Yes. Like I, I, he was next to Kurt Campbell, and then on the other side was Nicholas Burns, the, the, the U.S. ambassador to China. And they were more or less pretty stony face. but Blinken, <laughs> he wears his emotions on his face, that's for sure. I think he was seeing months and months of hard work potentially flying out the window. Right. I mean, yes. I, I wonder whether it was somewhat intentional on the political side of Biden. Obviously, yeah, um, Secretary of State Blinken won't have quite as much of an insight into Biden's political calculations. Obviously, he's a government official and he's not a political advisor per se. Um, from, from, from Blinken's perspective, the context here is that Biden already called Xi a dictator back in, in June right. after the whole spy balloon fiasco. Um, and China responded furiously, as you might imagine, said Biden's comments were, um, and I quote here, an open political provocation which violated etiquette and violated China's political political dignity. Um, so it, it has some precedence. So I think that's why Blinken reacted the way he did. But luckily for Biden, um, it seems like the Chinese haven't reacted too much yet. Um, the Chinese foreign ministry said Biden's comments were erroneous and irresponsible. That's pretty weak source compared to what they're used to, used to saying. I would say that Xi Jinping is still in the US. Um, so we probably have to wait a few days to see if that's going to be the holding line going forward or whether when Xi Jinping gets back to China, they start to get upset about it. But, um, you know, it's really up to Beijing. They have a choice. Beijing has a choice whether they make a big deal out of this or not. Um, but so far, so good. I think, I think John, you're right to, to recognize that Biden was in some way speaking to a domestic political audience. Uh, we'll, we'll come back to that. But we've got the, the dictator assessment out of the way. So now let's go back to the beginning. Could be a good place for a record scratch. <laughs> SpongeBob style, you know, uh, for hours earlier. Uh, but, you know, what, what's the background for this meeting? Um, or more specifically, where was this meeting taking place? The very specific, probably too specific answer to your question is uh, at the Filoli Gardens in, uh, well, just outside of San Francisco in California. Uh, just a real stunning looking estate, if I'm honest. I was jealous that I wasn't there in the California sunshine lapping in the grounds. Uh, I, I sort of recommend readers and, and listeners to go and have a look, Google photos of this place because it'll make you jealous. Um, it's actually had a, kind of, a, a, a ton of movies and TV shows set there. I think uh, Dynasty, the, the 80s mm. soap opera, which uh, no, I was really. obviously not born yet, Ethan. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and uh, one I do 
admittedly remember, which is the 1997 classic George of the Jungle with Brendan Fraser. Oh, that, yes. that, that was set there too. Yes, Brendan Fraser in the title role. That's great stuff, John. Uh, but more generally, where did this meeting take place? Yes, okay, more generally, uh, a less a less uh, smart-ass answer is um, on the <laughs> sidelines of the APEC Summit. Uh, that's the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Summit. It was hosted in San Fran. Um, look, honestly, I, we've had a bit to do with APEX in the past. My colleagues and I have former diplomatic lives. There's not much to say about it. We, I think we said in the newsletter that it's the least sexy of the global forums. It's a low bar and yet that's it, it manages to uh, certainly come up at the bottom of that list. Um, I think a good, a, good measure, a good way to measure a given kind of multilateral organization's significance is by checking the guest list. And, you know, APEX summits in the past, the US vice president tends to go instead of the president. So it's it's not really seen as kind of like the the the, the big hitting summit. I will say it's important to regional players, um, you know, in terms of they get in the same room and chat. And and I think interestingly, Xi Jinping has gone to every single one of them since he became the leader of China back in 2012. So um, you know, I wouldn't say it's unimportant, but it's certainly not, you know, the UNGA or 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 anything like that. Um, but you know, this year's summit was in San Francisco. Biden didn't, Biden didn't have to go that far uh, to meet President Xi Jinping. And so that's how we get to where we are. You're right. You're right to call it the least sexy, lest we forget, you know, the G7 opens every summit with uh, uh, Marvin Gaye. Let's get it on. That's <laughs> famous for that sort of thing. Very sexy. I wish they, I wish they would. Very sexy. Uh, but yes, uh, back to the point, you know, getting getting these two together, no small feat. Leaving aside all the stresses in the U.S.-China relationship right now, Xi just he hasn't visited the U.S. since since 2016, mm. and the, the two have only met face to face, you know, twice in the now three years since Biden took office. Yeah, I think that's right, um, and I think that's probably the thing that both sides will be celebrating, right? Like the fact that they actually managed to get into a room and and have what seems like to be a fairly conciliatory. If not super productive, but a, a good step, a good step in the right direction. Um, they struck a few agreements. We can get to those, um, but I think yeah, the real victory is getting them to chat at all. Uh, you know, we've heard U.S. policymakers and analysts repeat this phrase over and over that the goal at the moment is to kind of set a floor under the relationship. Oh god, I know, yeah. right? It's um, we've said it a few times ourselves because unfortunately, it is probably the best way to describe what they're trying to do without getting too optimistic. That, that really is the goal. Just like, let's stop the downward spiral. Um, and you know, things aren't great at the moment. I think we all know that and, and keeping them from getting worse is a, is a really worthy goal as jargony and unambitious as it sounds. Um, I think Biden told reporters at the, the presser afterwards that his overriding message to Xi Jinping was that, and, and, and this is a quote, I think, um, he said, if either one of us have any concerns about anything between our nations or anything happening in the region, we should pick up the phone and call one another and we'll always take the mm-hmm. call. That's the important progress that we've made. Um, and I think that's probably the best way to sum it up. I mean, besides this this floor setting, was there any other progress, any any tangible deals that either of them can point to? Yeah, look, there were a few because you can't have an international meeting like this without having a few bits of paper that point to something that you've done. Um, I'm being a little bit facetious because I think one of them at least was pretty important and that's that China agreed to restore high-level military-to-military talks, um, which they suspended back in August when uh, former Speaker of the House, who was then Speaker at the time, Nancy Pelosi, she went to Taiwan to kind of, you know, fact find, I think is the is the term of art they use. Um, so China was very upset about that and and they cut off all, com- uh, all military conversations, which I, I think is pretty worrying. So reinstating those is a big deal, but it also led to an agreement on AI as well at, at this meeting between Xi and Biden. Both sides promised not to use it in autonomous systems like drones or in nuclear command and control, which wasn't a thing that I had thought about before this. So now I've got a whole new thing to worry about, <laughs> AI running amok in nuclear command and control. So that's great. But I mean, it feels like a good thing that we can agree on that AI should probably not be in these kinds of systems. Um, so yeah, I think restoring military communications, that's the kind of floor setting that we're talking about. That two superpowers, we need to, we need to make sure that they're at least talking about military matters to avoid disaster. Um, Aside from that big one, there are a few others which I think are less important. Um, Biden, I know, was quite keen to highlight 
during his press conference that there, there was a deal with Beijing to crack down on the precursors to making fentanyl, which is the horrific opioid that's you know really truly ravaging America. It's it's horrific. Um, in return, he gets some sanctions relief um, on a security agency, a Chinese security agency that's been accused of human rights violations in uh, in Xinjiang against the Uyghur Muslims. Um, and and I should I should be clear here too. China actually agreed to form a working group to look at the issue of fentanyl. Um, a few folks who are very smart on Twitter, um, I think, have been making this point that China has kind of agreed to think about how they might crack down on it. So it's a little bit short of cracking down on it. Um, but either way, President Biden seemed very happy about that for, for good reason. As I said, fentanyl has been a huge killer in the US. Um, Look, I think my two cents on that is that they had to cook up a deal because the two had to announce something. You can't kind of come out of a, a meeting like that with nothing because then that looks like a real negative thing. Um, but I'd be surprised if this deal kind of means anything in the medium to long term. But I really hope I'm wrong on that. Um, and then I, re I realize I'm, I'm monologuing a bit here, but we'll, we'll get through all the things they agreed to. The last kind of two things, one Biden didn't mention, and that's that China uh, pledged to ramp up renewable deployment and restart climate talks. Um, so that's a good thing, potentially going into the COP28 meeting in a couple of weeks in uh, Dubai. Um, it didn't make it into Biden's announcements, which you know maybe that's significant. Maybe there's nothing there, or maybe that's just domestic political considerations for Biden not wanting to talk too much about climate change. Um, yeah, I mean, you might be sensing that I'm a bit skeptical about all of this stuff, and, and that's because I think it was pretty thin gruel um, in terms of announcements and meaningful progress. But again, they talked. John, last question before we take a, a quick break, widen the aperture a bit to look at some of the broader context. Uh, can we get a vibe check between between these two? Weird question, maybe an important one. No, vibes are, vibes are super important at all times, <laughs> Ethan. You know this. Uh, and to be honest, diplomacy is kind of like 90% vibes anyway. Um <laughs> I think the vibes were pretty reasonable, um, to be honest with you. I, I, I went in pretty skeptical and I, and I remain pretty skeptical overall, but I think the vibes were better than I thought. Um, some smiles, both administrations were pretty warm um, and certainly held their tongue during the meetings. Uh, you know, so there was, there was a, certainly, I think, an effort from both sides to kind of approach this with um, – Good faith, let's put it that yeah. way. Dictator, um, the dictator comment could be a bit of a vibe killer, but you and I have both been called worse. So. Well, that's exactly right. Right before coming on air too, which I will have a word about <laughs> afterwards. Um, <laughs> it's interesting you ask about vibes because both leaders are always kind of quick to point out the vibes of these kinds of things, but they've known each other for a while, uh, a long time in, in terms of world leaders. Dates back to when they were both vice presidents, so before – 2012, um, Biden often likes to talk about the fact that he spent 68 hours with Xi during his vice presidency, Biden's vice presidency, and he knows him better than any other world leader. And, and that's that's not that's not nothing. Um, after after their meeting, she had a, a dinner with business leaders, or as I saw it termed, the business elite, which sounds very fancy. Um, and he suggested that. This is Xi Jinping suggested that uh, China might send some of the pandas back to the US that they wow. just removed as a token of goodwill. Um, so that if, I don't know, if, if you're agreeing to send pandas somewhere, the vibes are immaculate at that point, right? Last point that I found amusing, because this it was kind of it was kind of interesting to unpick it all in great detail, but um, <laughs> Biden uh, apparently shares his birthday with uh, Xi Jinping's wife. 20th of November. So what, Tuesday? Not far uh, from yours. Well, that's that's right. Um, my birthday, which never rolls around. No, wait, 20th is is Monday. So they're both but both getting older on, on Monday. Um, anyway, Biden told she, please wish your wife a happy birthday, uh, to which she apparently responded that he had forgotten it was her birthday because he'd been working so hard, of course. Uh, but he thanked <laughs> Biden for the reminder. Now, I don't know about you, Ethan, but that's that's either some like excellent passive aggressive shade from Biden, uh, or and 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 I and I I'll give him the benefit of the doubt and say he was just trying to be nice. But either way, she used literally the worst excuse in the book. You know, oh dear, I was too busy. So I think he might have some splaining to do on the plane on the way back to Beijing. Married men worldwide, shivering in fear. <laughs>
Today's episode is brought to you by Talk Eastern Europe, the official podcast of the new Eastern Europe magazine. Each week, Talk Eastern Europe helps listeners better understand the complexities of Central and Eastern Europe from the war in Ukraine, recent elections in Poland, the Serbia-Kosovo conflict, and absolutely everything in between. Check out Talk Eastern Europe wherever you get your podcasts or at the link in the show notes. All right, welcome back. So, John, let's just examine for a bit here why this meeting took place when it took place. Um, Yes, you know, like we said, she was in town, but he could have just as easily stayed home, maybe with his wife. Uh, So why do you think he wanted to meet Biden now? I think it's a really important question. Um, and, And it's a question you can answer pretty bluntly in saying that things aren't going particularly well for China right now on the home front, um, on the domestic economic front, and arguably the domestic political front, but we don't have much insight into China's politics. Um, You know, obviously he's consolidated his power as as the leader of the Communist Party, uh, but I think the broader macroeconomic trends in China aren't aren't great. Um, No, we've covered it on on previous episodes over this year, really, that the housing market there is in a real bad place with debt. Um, Urban youth unemployment has hit, I think, a record high of around 21.3%, which is fairly fairly kind of unthinkable um, for us in in, in, other, in the Western countries. Um, and, and I think that was so bad that the government agency responsible for unemployment statistics said that it would stop tracking that one, which is an elegant solution, if not a uh, productive one. <laughs> um, and, and of course, foreign, uh, foreign investment in China is, is plummeting. Uh, you know, Western companies or not even Western, international companies are, are pulling their money out at a, at a great rate of knots. Um, so I think those issues... Probably the last one, the lack of, you know, the, the outflow of capital is probably the one that most explains why she went to San Francisco this week because he wants to stop that. Like I mentioned, after after his meeting with Biden, he went off to the business elite at, you know, $2,000 a ticket dinner with uh, Xi Jinping with the business elite. Um, and I think that was designed to kind of restore confidence in American industry of that China's business environment is safe and open for business. Um, so I think that was probably one of his key deliverables for this for this trip and biden well, how about how about him yeah it's an interesting one i think you have to think a, a bit more carefully about it obviously there aren't the same sort of domestic pressures in terms of economic pressures right now nothing that biden really needs from china um economically but i think he looks out at the world right now president looks out at the world and sees a war in ukraine that america has pledged to stay involved with same in the middle east with israel and gaza i think the last thing he wants in an election year, because that's the big elephant in the room here is next year is a crazy American election year. He doesn't need more conflict. He doesn't need more stress. Um, and in particular, Taiwan um, in this case. Um, and and more, than, more than just kind of avoiding it, I think he probably thinks that China can be helpful with those other conflicts, um, you know, not necessarily resolving them, but perhaps not escalating them, controlling their spread, you know, using some influence here and there to just get sides to pull back a little bit. So, you know, I think Biden's record shows him as a little bit of a, a China hawk. Probably not the most hawkish in America, but he, he's certainly he's certainly been fairly firm with them. Um, but he kind of has to balance that instinct now against a broader priority, which is kind of keeping a lid on things all around the world. Um, I think one thing to watch as we get closer to the U.S. election next November is that the bipartisan consensus in Washington that has emerged around China, and it's really the only one that I can think of that has been pretty lockstep between Democrats and Republicans in the U.S., that might start to get a little bit shakier. I think politically, they might uh, both sides might see an advantage in trying to drive a wedge in their China positions. Um, and I think we saw that a little bit after uh, Republican lawmakers came out and criticized Biden for for taking the meeting with Xi at all. So that's one to watch. But it's not just the, the US that's in an election year. I mean, we've also got the, the Taiwanese, you mentioned Taiwan, of course, elephant mm-hmm. in every room uh, that Xi and Biden are in. We've got Taiwanese elections coming up on the 13th of January. Yeah, we do. That's remarkably soon somehow. Um, And not to get too sidetracked, uh, but we actually saw two of Taiwan's opposition parties team up this week to unseat uh, the currently ruling pro, maybe not pro-independence, but um, independence-minded. Independence-minded ruling party. That's right. Um, And these two opposition parties agreed that they'll team up behind a single unified candidate, um, which immediately makes them more competitive than they would have otherwise been. I don't know that it's 
it, look, it's too early to say how that election's going to go. It, it may be close. It may not be. Um, but the election is between a party that China doesn't really like, uh, the ruling party now, and a coalition that I think Beijing probably thinks it can work with um, more constructively for its own interests. I think Biden said this week that he had received assurances from China that they wouldn't interfere in that Taiwanese election. You know, I, again, not to be the resident cynic here, Ethan, I don't know that I'd take Xi Jinping's word for that <laughs> necessarily. Um, so, you know, I think, I think if Xi's preferred parties, the opposition, if they lose in January, particularly if they lose badly in January, I think you would see tensions start to rise again, just as China worries about losing Taiwan to that more independence-minded grip. Um, so I guess all of that is to say that there's two critical elections coming up. This is a, a relatively calm period. We should be happy that they're talking, uh, but it could potentially be a more difficult year in 2024 for US-China relations. Um, and, and of course, if it does get more difficult, it's unlikely that Biden and she will meet again before the presidential vote in next November, the US presidential vote. So that might that might be an argument for making it harder to reset again if you get my my drift. Um, so I think I think that was the goal of this meeting, right? Is to say, hey, we're not going to meet again. Some stuff might happen over the next year that is difficult. Let's make sure we've kind of cleared the communication line so that we can pick up the phone and avoid catastrophes um, if they happen. And you know what? By that measure, it seems like it was pretty successful. Well, John, your birthday's coming up. Let's be honest. Your birthday's coming up, and uh, I feel like I and the intrigue community should be getting you a gift. And, and here we are. Here we are, having received a gift, the gift of your wisdom. So thank you so much for coming <laughs> on. Yeah. yeah, you're very welcome, Ethan. <laughs> And that's going to do it for me. By the way, that Taiwan story that John mentioned at the end there about the two parties teaming up to contest January's election, it's actually a pretty big one. And if you want to learn more about why it happened and what it means, be sure to check out today's International Intrigue newsletter. In the meantime, I'm Ethan Plotkin. See you on Tuesday. <laughs>